very much, and I'm truly grateful this evening that the Lord loves us that much, aren't you? Amen. I think I'll just hold this. I think I'll be more comfortable with it. You know, I can, before I begin my testimony, I was just thinking, I think I almost know how Moses felt when the Lord called him out. And he said, Lord, I can't speak. So the Lord took that excuse away and gave him a speaker. Now, I've been looking all night for one, and I have not found one. Amen. So uh, the Lord's going to have to do it for me. I believe he will, don't you? Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, it's great to be here and to feel his presence and I trust that what we share with you this evening will be a blessing to you and will glorify God. Any comment that I make, that I intend to make, won't be for any purpose except to give praise to God. Amen. We have nothing to boast or brag about, only in Jesus. Praise God. I might say before I begin my testimony that the Lord had blessed me with a strong physical body. I had never been sick, that is to speak of, maybe a cold, something minor. Never been in the hospital except one time in my teens when I was injured wrestling and had a brief stay in the hospital then, but nothing of any serious nature. So really I didn't know what sickness was. The Lord had blessed me. So it was quite a shock when we learned in December of 67, when we entered the Bryan Memorial Hospital here in Durant for what we thought would be a minor operation, something that would soon be over and forgotten about and, you know, not much to it. Dr. Bob Ingalls performed the operation and Two days later, he came in the hospital room where my wife and I were in, and he shared with us the tragic news. It was quite a burden on Dr. Bob. He loved us. We love him, and he believes in God. He told us the seriousness of it, and he told me, as I have said, I have always wanted to be told if I had some bad news like this, I wanted somebody to look me in the face and tell me the way it was. So he did. And he said, Bill, there's absolutely nothing that I can do for you. We don't know why these things happen. They just happen. Now, I have a surgeon friend in Oklahoma City, he said, that is one of the top four in the country in this field. He's a perfectionist. He knows what he's doing. I advise immediate surgery again, and perhaps he can prolong your life. Now, it didn't take a genius to figure that statement out. I knew that Dr. Bob was saying, look, you're going to be here for a short time. That's it. Maybe they can help you in Oklahoma City extend this period, perhaps, but that's the best you can hope for. After sharing this news with my wife and I, he turned and walked out and shut the door. It was then that we more or less went to pieces. My world had fallen apart. I mean, just overnight, it had fallen apart. And I temporarily gave up. We have to share it with you like it is. I temporarily gave up. I said, what's the use? I mean, this is it. It's happened. I mean, there's you know, not anything to look forward to. And this was the condition, the state of mind that I was in. When the ambulance loaded me to leave for Oklahoma City from the Brown Memorial Hospital, the devil spoke to me. I know it was the devil because... He brings bad news. He brings evil thoughts. He brings things contrary to the will of God. And here's what he said to me. 
He said, take a good look around. This is your last ride. Forcefully. I mean, it, it was strong. And you know what? I believed him. I believed him. As they left town, they had the curtains pulled back, and I looked at every house, tree, car, person, fully believing that this was my last ride. I thought I, when I came back town, I wouldn't know it. But God had other plans. Praise God. God had other plans. The things I'm sharing with you, many of the individuals right here in this room can verify, and I shall never forget the role that Brother Max played. He was in college at Southeastern at this time, and he initiated many of the prayer meetings that were going on. I thank God for that. Amen. We'll be telling you a little bit more about that particular part in just a moment, but we got to the city and we began going numerous undergoing numerous tests preparing for the major surgery that was to come. Dr. William Perry, chief surgeon of the team that was to do the operation, was a brilliant man, and he did know what he was doing. Confident man, but he happened to be one that never mentioned God in any manner a lot of times you'll hear a physician say, well, it's up to a higher power. Many will say, well, only God can do it. I mean, they'll acknowledge God in one way or other. This man, while never speaking about God at all in any respect, he just simply didn't say anything about God. So I never quite knew his position. But he was a brilliant man. Ministers began to drop by and see us in Oklahoma City. Began to read us scriptures, pray with us and for us, talk to us and encourage us, and reports began to reach us, Brother Max, about these prayer meetings that were going on in this vicinity and in different churches around the country. As these reports began to reach us and as different ones came by to read scriptures and talk with us and pray for us, our spirits began to be lifted also. Amen. We began to be encouraged because there was a time during this that I, I was so low that I, I couldn't pray for myself. I had given up, if you know what I mean. But I began to look up and to try to help those that were so desperately trying to get a hold of God for me and in my behalf. Don't you thank God for your friends? Amen. People were praying. They were fasting. They were serious about this, and the Lord saw their tears. Amen. He heard their cry. Nothing that happened to me was because of the goodness that I possessed, because there wasn't any. Amen. And as I've said so many times, if God had truly given me what I deserved, I wouldn't be permitted, I wouldn't be privileged to be here sharing this with you this evening. But he doesn't look at those things, amen? He looks beyond those faults and those failures and the shortcomings. And he has mercy. Praise God. He has compassion upon us. Dr. Perry shared with us the seriousness of the operation that was to come, telling us that it was our decision whether to have it or whether not to. But he emphasized that if we didn't have this operation, that it would only be a matter of time until an operation wouldn't even help. Being a person that I've always liked to tell it like it is, I like to be sure of what I'm saying, that, that I don't misrepresent anything. Now, uh, when you come to w uh, testifying about God's healing, some will differ with me on this, but, I mean, you have to take it by faith. I know this, but I want to be very careful. I want to 
If I went out and said I was healed, I wanted to be sure that I was healed. And visiting with my pastor, I discussed this with him. I told him, I said, I believe God has already healed me. I believe I'm well. But they said, not so, because on the inside it was different. So I said, the only thing I know to do is to let them go ahead and operate. And then when they don't find anything, then I'll share it with the world. Amen. I'll have evidence to back it up. Praise God. I'll share it with the world. So this is the way that we entered into the second operation. I had often wondered in years prior to this, as I had watched others face severe trials or tests in their life, I had often wondered if the time came in my own life when I were to stare death in the face, what would my reaction be? I mean, I was curious. Would I stand the test? Would I be what God warned me to be? How would I react? I didn't know. I don't think anybody does know. But here I was in this position. And for the first time in my life, I really understood the grace of God. For the first time in my life, I knew what it was to actually not fear death, even though here it was in front of me. Amen. Because God took it away. Amen. Praise God. He took it away. Yes, I wanted to stay with my family. I enjoyed living. I enjoyed my friends. I wanted to stay. But if this was the will of God in my life, I didn't fear it. I could truthfully say for the first time in my life that the Lord had actually taken it out of my life. The second operation was to occur on a Monday morning, being a week exactly from the time the first operation had occurred, and all this time I had spent in bed. And you know what that does to your strength if there's nothing wrong with you just staying in bed. They had given me medicine to sleep by to go to sleep that night, but it didn't have any effect. I was wide awake because I was wondering what's ahead, you know, as I suppose anyone would. At 2.30 in the morning, a colored nurse walked into my room. I was by myself. She just walked in and looked down at me, and she pointed a finger, and she said, you're going to be okay. This is all she said, and she turned and left. I wasn't to see her again for a number of days, not really knowing what all this meant. There was no way for me to know at the time. The length of the surgery that day extended into 11 hours and 40 minutes. Actual surgery time. This is documented. Not recovery time, but actual surgery time. Almost 12 hours. Some will wonder about the length of it, but part of the reason because of this was they were looking, they were probing. Because you see, something had happened to my body. Amen. Something had happened to it. It wasn't as the x-rays had told them it was. It wasn't as the test had revealed to them that they would find when they got inside. Huh. It wasn't that way. Because, you see, the Lord had already visited me. Praise God. He'd already been there. And the doctors couldn't accept this. They kept probing. They kept looking. They kept saying, it's got to be here. It's got to be. But it wasn't. Amen. And after 11 hours and 40 minutes, they gave up. 
They gave up. I'm glad they did. I spent 10 days and nights in intensive care, three days of which I was on the critical list because of the seriousness of the operation. During the 10 days and nights, if you've ever been to a ward of this nature, the lights never go out. They're there. You, you don't know if it's day or night. You don't, you don't know. And I saw countless ones that we were all just in one bed after another. If they needed to do something private, they just pulled the curtain around you and did that, and then they pulled the curtain back, and everything was back to normal. But during this time, I saw numerous ones as they would simply pull the sheet up over them and roll them out. This has a way of working on you. And this evil voice would say, hey, you're next. You're next. I just once again said, devil, you're a liar. I'm trusting God. Amen. And I'm okay because he said I was. Praise God. But the Lord sustained me and kept me. During this time of sickness, I had time to think. Now, many might wonder what you mean when you say this, but if you're a busy person, a real busy person, you know what I mean. Yes, I, you know, I had, you, you think automatically, but I mean to sit down and in quiet moments think, just think. It's a blessing to be able to do that. And I had been so busy, I thought that I hadn't had time to do this. But I had time now. I had plenty of time. And during this course of time, the Lord gave me many thoughts that were to prove a blessing then and in later years. And one of these, if I may share it with you, concerned Job. This wasn't in comparison, not at all. There's no way I could compare with that great man. But it was in this respect. I was reminded about the scripture of Job's plight. And I could hear, I could just almost hear the Lord and the devil having conversation. The devil said to the Lord, Lord, take old Bill down there. He's never been sick. That boy doesn't know what a test. He doesn't know what a trial. He doesn't know what a hard time is. You look how you blessed him. No, he's not a rich man, but he's had everything he needed. Had many things that he didn't really need, but he wanted and you gave it to him. You let me touch him. You let me afflict him. And I'll show you. He doesn't have what it takes. He'll turn his back on you. In reply, again, it's my imagination tuned in. I could hear the Lord say, Devil, once again, you're a liar. I'm going to let you touch him, but I'm just going to let you go so far. And he gave him the depth that he could go to. He gave him the law, and the devil can't go past it. Amen. He said, I'm going to let you touch him. And I'm going to show you that my servant has what it takes to live for me. Amen. And as these thoughts came to me, I had to have a conversation with the Lord. And I said, God, 
I want you to give to me the ability, the determination, the grace, the strength to be what you told the devil that I was. Master, I want to live up to what you told him there was. I don't want to fail you. Amen. And these thoughts help me. It helped me to keep a strong faith and determination in God. And many times since then, I've thought of this very thing as a difficult time would come along. And once again, I said, God, I don't want to fail you. Amen. I want to be what you said I was. Amen. I want to live up to what you said I was. I want to be faithful to you. In our path in life, we may never know where the Lord may take us. And many times, you may be asked to go out of the way down life's path as this sidetrack of mine was. You may be asked to do something or to undergo something to make sure that a certain individual is reached. Amen. During this whole in hospital stay, there was one roommate, only one during this whole time, and that only for a short few days. But I got to share with this gentleman what God had done for me. I got to read him scriptures from my Bible and talk with him about the Lord. And I had the satisfaction of seeing him the day before he was to be released. His wife bought him a Bible and brought it to the hospital room. Though, though there was no actual confession of faith there, and though I don't know the results, but I had the satisfaction of feeling that I had answered the call of God. Amen. And I said, Lord, if I'm here because of him, it's worth it. It's worth it. Just help me to do what you want me to do. Praise God. And to not fail you at that time. The morning of the day that I was to be released from the hospital, at 5.30 in the morning, I was by myself, and this colored nurse appeared. She said, uh, do you remember me? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, do you remember what I said to you? I said, I couldn't forget it. She said, do you know why I said it? I said, I have no idea. She said, well, seeing that you're going home today, I felt like I had to talk with you. And here's the way she put it. She said, you see, I'm a servant of God. And as I walk these hospital aisles, he talks to me. And he tells me things to do. People to see and what to say to them. And she said, that night I came to your room. He had spoken to me. And though I didn't know who was there, I didn't know what was wrong with you. But he said, come and tell you that all was well. Praise God. Hallelujah. And she said, I just brought the message that God gave me and told you. As she turned and left, it was time to talk to God again. Amen. And I said, God, there goes the type of person that I want to be. Praise God. If God blesses you, amen, with a Cadillac or Cadillacs and mansions and whatever, and you can't hear the voice of God after all these blessings, you don't need it. Amen. You can have that and have God too. But if God blesses you with it and then you can't hear the voice of God, you're better off without it. Amen. I said, God, I want to be that type of person. One that can hear your voice even in the middle of night and say, Lord, here I am, send me. Amen. Just whatever you want me to do, that's what I want to do. Amen. 
Isn't that how you want to be? Praise God. Just a vessel to be used of God. That same day, Dr. William Perry came to my room. And he spent at least 30 minutes, which is extremely long for a doctor to be tied up with any one patient. But he talked to my wife and I, and he was strictly looking at it from the medical view because he knew how serious the nature of the illness had been. And he was determined in his own mind that sooner or later, later it would claim me. So he was giving me advice. He said, now I want you to go back home and I want you to stay busy. I don't want you to get off by yourself and get thinking about it. Stay busy. Be with people. Don't let your mind dwell on it. I just let him talk. When he got through, I said, Doc, I feel compelled to tell you something. I said, I first want to acknowledge all your effort because he had been great. I want to thank you for everything you've done for me because you have truly, really tried hard, and I thank you for it. But people were praying for me, and that you find cancer in my body. It wasn't your did this. Amen. Not, to, but it wasn't of God. At Justin, Doc, I don't have any to do. I'm home. I'm going to be known. And I've never seen it. <laughs> well, I said, Doc, I don't have cancer. Worry about what? Hey, I'm not going to worry. It's gone. And I'm well. Be the day shortly that I'll be strong as I was. Hey, folk, I've seen it. It's given me taking no treatments. The only thing they home with was iron tablets. That's all. He said, well, I like your attitude. <laughs> Good comment, I suppose. <laughs> but who is to say about possibly even the impact on that doctor? This testimony has opened many doors for us. I'd like to share with you briefly maybe a couple of them. One occurred about nine months after this. At the time of my illness, I was working for the Prudential Insurance Company of America. Only a few months prior to that had I started to work for them. And before I worked for them, I didn't have hospital insurance. So God prepared the way and gave me a testimony, and he also paid the bill. Praise God. He, he paid the bill because I had group insurance. I'd still probably be paying on it if it hadn't have been this way. But he paid the bill. While I was off work, I received disability pay from Prudential, but it was only a portion of my regular earnings, and we were used to living at a certain level, and you can understand, all of a sudden when you drop down, the bills go on at the regular pace. So when I went back to work, I was behind on my debts. There were bills that were unpaid, and I believe, I sincerely believe, that a Christian should pay the bill. I believe you should live and do where that your life is an influence so that when you witness to somebody, your life will back it up. And I, I felt very strongly about this, and I wanted, I wanted to catch up on these bills, and I wanted to pay them. So I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, I want you to give me the ability. I want you to give me the knowledge, the wisdom, to present these plans to people that are interested and just lead me to those that you'd have me go to and help them to accept me. 
In just a short time, my sales efforts were recognized by the head office, and I was summoned as a guest speaker in Lawton, Oklahoma. Randy can tell you how I feel about speaking. I tried to turn this down, but no, you didn't turn that down either. So we went. I shared the room at the Holiday Inn with a Christian gentleman here in town, Baptist man, good Christian man. And he and I had that one thing in common. But if you've ever been to an insurance convention, then you can understand what I'm about to tell you. Because it's a wicked place. The night before is filled with reveling, gambling, drinking, all sorts of vice. This is facts. But my roommate and I were not interested in these things. We just simply went quietly to our room and retired and got a good night's rest, except me, because I was fighting what the Lord was trying to get me to do. And he had spoken to me and said, This will be a witness. You're here to be a witness. And I kept saying, No, no. The quality of these men that are before me, they'll think I'm out of my mind. They'll think I'm fanatic. They'll think I'm foolish. Lord, I can't do it. But he kept dealing with me. All night long, I'd, wake, I'd awaken with a start, wide awake. And again, he'd say, are you? And I, I would fight it. The next morning, we went to the meeting, and I was fifth in line, speaker. Each speaker would try to outdo the other with a filthier joke. Each one would try to outdo the one before him on just how dirty he could get it. Cigar, cigarette smoke so thick you could hardly breathe. This is maybe it bothered me more because I'm a non smoker. But nevertheless it made it difficult. The gentleman before me reached in a paper sack and grabbed a big handful of money, threw it across the floor, reached back and got another hand, threw it across the floor. When the commotion died down, he said, uh, if you're wondering whose money that is, that's Mr. Gore's. Mr. Gore happened to be the district manager, main, main man. He said, uh, I won it last night in a friendly game. Of course, this was quite funny, you know, to everybody. But all of a sudden, a voice spoke to me and said, Bill, these men are not ashamed of the master they're serving are you? And when it was put to me in this manner, I said, no, Lord, I'm not. I am not ashamed of you. And when they called my name, my outline didn't have God in it. I had made an outline, and it didn't have God. And I went to the podium scared, and I was trembling. And I actually took hold of it to steady myself. But as I began to speak, I felt the calmness, and I felt assurance. I gave the general outline of my daily work habits, how I went about getting prospects and my sales activities, things in general that a salesman does. And after I had given what I had on my list, I said, John, Mr. Gore asked me to share with you the secret of my success. I haven't done it yet, but I'm about to. If I didn't have their attention before that, I had it then. Because, you see, a genuine salesman 
he's interested in, in, in gimmicks. You know? I mean, I don't mean anything off-level or anything, but I mean something new that will attract sales, that will get people to listen and to buy what he has. So I had attention. The Lord gave me words because I didn't have time to think it out because, you see, prior to that, as I told you, I wasn't going to do it. It went something like this. I said, gentlemen, with the degree of intelligence that we have represented here today, you're all too smart to be an atheist. There's not an atheist in this crowd. I mean, I know there's not. You're too smart for that. I said, all of you know how sick I was. You know what was wrong with me. Look, I was behind on my debts. There were bills that were unpaid. I went to the only source that I knew wouldn't fail me. Never had failed me. It was a sure thing. I said, gentlemen, I got on my knees. And I asked God to be my partner and to help me and to give me the ability to do what I have done. Simple? Yes. But that is the secret of my success. Thank you. As I took my seat, Mr. Gore stood. Never being a man without words, he stood and looked at the floor for one full minute. And believe me, that's a long time when things are quiet. He shook his head. He sat down. The gentleman here got up and tried to keep it from being an embarrassing situation, and he tried to carry on. And after two or three moments, Mr. Gore said, could I say a word? Of course, he could say a word any time he wanted to. So he stood once again. He looked at the floor. He was speechless. This time for about 30 seconds. He shook his head one more time. He said, I'm shook up, and sat down. My staff manager called my wife before I was a able to even get back home, and he told her that that was one of the best things that had ever happened at, at a convention. Now, there again, I have nothing to measure it with, but I had peace and satisfaction and joy in knowing that I had done what God wanted me to do. Praise God. I had done what the Lord wanted me to do, and he helped me. And he also helped me to leave the company in good standing, and, and they're my friends today. One other incident, if I may share it with you, and I won't detain you long. The Lord, having given us a music ministry, The Lord helped us after this happened to us to be able to share this testimony all across the nation, crisscrossed several times, coast to coast, and we shared this. And during this time, there were a number of times, one in particular that I remember so vividly in Birmingham, Alabama on a Sunday night. There was a young man and his wife, and they came forward to be saved at the end of the service. And they left, and we were get, getting our equipment packed up and ready to leave. They came back. The young man walked up to me, and he said, Sir, I just felt like coming back and telling you. It was your testimony that reached me tonight. I said, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. Of course, with us as a team, as a family, 
we all share the same feeling. It doesn't matter just as long as God touches somebody. Amen. It doesn't matter whose song is blessed. Amen. As long as God does a blessing and he, he reaches and he touches men and women. This one incident that I'd like to share. We received a call from a talent agency. How many of you have heard of the 48 Hours in Toka? Have you heard of it? turned out to be more of a rock concert than anything else. But this was in the preparation stage at that time. I received this call and this gentleman told me his reason for calling. He said, we'd like to have you on the program. I said, uh, I've been reading about the 48 hours in Toka. I think you've got the wrong person. He said, uh, no, sir. I said, we're gospel. He said, yes, I realize that. I said, please explain to me why you call me. I don't know why you're interested in a gospel group. He said, in preparation for this concert, we polled the four major areas that we would be pulling from. Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Dallas, and Fort Worth. And people were asked questions, what performers would you most like to hear at this concert? And on this same questionnaire was what gospel group would you most like to hear? And he said, your name came up more than anybody else's. That's, that's why we called you. I said, impressive, but I'm not interested. He said, uh, you don't turn this down. I said, I have. He said, uh, I'll call you back in two days. You think about it. We spent those two days, I don't mean just every hour, but off and on as we'd get together, talking, praying about it, wondering what to do. We wanted to be sure we did what God wanted us to do. And I was reminded in the scriptures where that the Lord went home with sinners. He went home and he ate with them. Amen. If they had ever thought he thought he was better than they, he could they they wouldn't have listened to a thing he said. But he was a common man. Amen. I, I'm not degrading the Lord when I say that. I mean he was he was a man. Amen. And he went home with sinners. Praise God. Their house was different when he left. He went home with them, and he ate with them. And we said, perhaps this is God opening this door, and if so, we don't want to shut it. So we set some stipulations purely to know that it was the hand of God. And this was part of it. We said we are to receive equal billing with the other performers, equal time. There will be no restrictions during this time on stage. What we can do or say, it's ours. Hands off. And we set an extreme price, not for the money. This was for confirmation. And we were absolutely that we wasn't I mean, there wasn't to be any giving on any part of it. They would either accept it like it was, or we'd just say, well, it's not God. I mean, we're just, we're just going to accept that it. it's not God. So he called us back. I read to him our stipulations. And he was quiet only for a moment or so. He said, I see no reason why we can't do business together. I'll forward your contract. And he did, specifying these terms. At the concert, that Howard Patrol estimated 40,000 plus. The promoters tried to say 100,000 plus until the Internal Revenue 
got involved, and then they were quite willing to accept the Highway Patrolman's estimate. Ten dollars a head, you see, it made quite a bit of difference. But there were, you could say, mountains of people, because everywhere you looked, there were people. And hardly dressed. Now, they say at one time there were people that wasn't dressed. We didn't see it, thank God. But here would be two or three or four sitting here, and they would drink beer or whiskey or whatever they had until the cans got so it just fallen over on them, and then they'd just lay back and kick them over and keep drinking. And this is what you were looking at. Trash human and otherwise. We're, we're trash except through God. Amen. And I was filled with disgust. I'd never seen anything like it. As we were backstage getting ready to come on, I said, God, I know the feeling in my heart isn't right. I mean, I resented it. I resented exposing my family to it. I said, Lord, help me. Help me. Give me compassion. And help me to have the feeling that you want me to have. I want to help them. I don't want to hurt them. I want to help them. Praise God. Once again, the thoughts came to me and said, Bill, you're not here to be a witness to the great stars. Most of them have had their chance at one time or other. But these folk in front of you is why you're here. Do what I ask you. I said, yes, Lord. Yes, I will. As we went on stage, and again, wondering what we'd say or do next. Time came for my testimony, and I gave it in a way that I had never given it before or since. There's a time and place for all things, and God knows exactly how to do it and when to do it. But I said something of this nature, if I may recollect it, I said, in our years of ministry, the Lord has permitted us to rub shoulders with some of the so-called greats. But I found one thing in common among these greats, or middle class, or low class, or any class you want to classify yourself in. I said, if I were to walk out among you today and ask you, do you believe in God? Do you believe in God? Some of you may even be ashamed to the extent that you'd say no rather than hear your friend next to you, hear you admit that you believe there's a God. But I found one thing in common, friends. When you come to the end, and then I gave them my testimony, as we do when we're on the road, when you come to the end and you realize this is it, nothing else matters. Big, small, huh? Doesn't matter. And you may never have done it before, but you'll acknowledge then that there is a God. It may be too late, but you'll acknowledge there is a God. Praise God. I don't know the result of that meeting. I've been privileged to see one young person since that time that was there that was quite influenced by drugs at the time. Excuse me, but he told me, this young person told me, that he wasn't so out of his mind 
He said, the words you were saying, I couldn't get away from them. He said, they haunted me. They haunted me. He didn't say that's why he got saved. That didn't matter. The, the important thing was he was saved when I was talking to him then. He'd been saved since. That may have had a small part in it. I don't know. But once again, I thank God that we were privileged to be in the place, the time, that he asked us to be. Amen. Praise God. I trust that some part of this testimony, and I hope it hasn't been too lengthy, I hope it's been a blessing to you. And I hope if a test or trial comes your way, that something during of this will come to your mind that will be an inspiration and be a help to you and help you to reach up and get a hold of that sure hand. Praise the Lord. And to hold on because, folk, he will lead us out.